Hi everyone, as our attendees arrive, um, I, I just give you a few minutes to get in and um, then we, we're going to get started in about, in about a minute's time. Now, hello to our attendees and uh, good good morning, good afternoon to our to our um, presenters today. So um, I'm, I'll, pre I'll introduce our presenters in just a moment. Um, right now, I'm just going to talk you through the um, the uh, what we do in Deconnect and uh, invite you to um, to use our services for the good of your business. So um, can I just ask uh, our presenters to let me know if you can see that in present mode? Yeah. You can see it in present mode, that's great, thank you. So, um, just start at the beginning. So in Deconnect, we are the digital health innovation hub based at Dundalk University, uh, sorry, Dundalk Institute of Technology, a soon to be university. Um, and uh, we, so we, we provide business supports to the digital health sector. So um, the types of supports we provide are we have a connected cluster. So we have um, uh, we've got 30 companies and growing in a knowledge sharing cluster. And we meet um, on a monthly basis to share learnings. Um, we provide education programs and bespoke training. We provide, provide business supports such as one-to-one -one mentoring. We help businesses with digital transformation as they digitize their products and services and operations. And we also help with internationalization. So we, we uh, will introduce you to international markets, to Enterprise Ireland supports with regard to entering international markets. And yesterday, for example, we had a webinar um, in conjunction with the Connected Health and Wellbeing Cluster that um, uh, introduced um, Enterprise Ireland in Boston and um, we had a speaker from Silicon Valley who told us about a, an, an Irish company um, how, how to enter the um, the US market um, you know what what their go-to-market strategy was so um, those supports are ongoing at any time you're welcome to um, connect with us after the webinar um, if you would like to utilize our supports, most of them are free, we can also help you to access an innovation voucher worth 5000 euro if there's a particular piece of research you would like to do. Uh, so our knowledge sharing cluster, I've just talked you through that we have clinicians SMEs startups corporates on there. We provide education and training. So we write bespoke um, education programs, incubators and accelerators with corporate sponsors uh, to, to um, help you help accelerate your growth. Um, our business supports include um, mentoring um, and a, a advice with your go to market strategy. Um, and I've talked you through digitization and internationalization already. So we're coming to the end of our um, nuts and bolts uh, uh, series. Uh, apologies, if I didn't update the dates there at the bottom, but um, we, um, we uh, this is the very last one and it's on the on the topic of cybersecurity. Um, so this is our team and uh, uh, so Carl Power is our director of programs. Um, I'm the community and education manager and Sarafel Demisi is our executive um, software technician who can help you with proof of concept prototypes and uh, to de develop your minimum viable product. Um, I'm just going to go back to this slide to outline the, the nuts and bolts series to you. So in that series, we've um, 
covered interoperability, um, which is vital if you want to connect with connect into existing healthcare systems such as the HSE and NHS, um, and uh, building healthcare solutions identifying your customer need, medical device regulation, um, IP and patents, GDPR and data privacy, and today it's cybersecurity. So those webinars are all available um, as recordings, and uh, we're pleased to say that many. Um, of our registrants who can't make it on the day, do, do access the recording afterwards. You'll receive the recording by email and it will also be on LinkedIn. So there's our contact details. Please feel free to contact us if you feel that we can be um, of uh, assistance to, to your business growth. And um, I'm going to stop sharing now and I'm going to introduce our expert contributors today. So um, today we have, um, I'm going to ask Albert and uh, Ray, to just turn on your cameras now and join us, um, please. Great. And I know, Ray, you've got a little bit of problem there with broadband stability. So you're you're making a guest appearance and then you're just maybe going to turn off the camera to make sure that it doesn't interfere with the stability of your presentation. So Ray is from IBM. Um, he's very familiar with the uh, startup S SME environment and he's an expert in cybersecurity. So he's going to talk us through an approach to cybersecurity, which is um, uh, which is attainable for small business, um, how to get started and uh, and how to develop a cybersecurity culture. Then um, Arthur is going to talk through Stat Sports um, journey through cybersecurity. So um, I'll, I'll leave Albert to uh, do a, an introduction to Stat Sports. Um, they are in existence about five years, Arthur, longer. You're, so you're on mute. No, we're over 10, actually, Sarah. Yes, I can't hear you there, Arthur. Is your sound? Okay. Oh, hold on. It might we're be. over 10. Over 10. 10. Over 10 years. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um, and uh, so we um, have had many discussions over the last few days about, you know, jogging Arthur's memory around that journey through cybersecurity, because yeah. when something becomes second nature to your business, sometimes it's difficult to remember what the journey entailed and how you got there. So the, um, the, the, the insights that Arthur will be able to give you about how, he uh, with the steps that he put in place and the help and um, and support that he leveraged also to to have uh, to develop a cyber secure culture in stat sports um, is very interesting. So first of all, I'm going to pass over now to Ray. Ray, will you please give an, a brief introduction to yourself, and then we'll hand over to you to do your presentation. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Hi, uh, Ray Matten here. So I would be a partner technology specialist in IBM. Um, Thirty two years in the IT sector. Out of that, I'd say 20 plus years would have been in and out of security. I'd set up my own company a number of years ago, dealing in security again. So I've been in and out of security and only in the last number of years getting back into security myself. Working with IBM for the last 12 to 14 years uh, in both security and automation. Okay. That's great. And um, Arthur, do you want to do your introduction now? And um, then we'll hand over to Ray. Yeah, sure. Hi, um, Arthur McMahon is my name. I'm the CTO in Stat Sports. I've been with them for, I think it's eight, nine years now at this stage. The, the years fly by very quickly. Probably for most of my life, I've been involved in startups. So I do understand the challenges that are involved in um, starting a company, what's involved and the challenges that you guys will, will face. And really what I want to uh, share here is the journey within Statsports, how we went from, let's say, a startup or essentially a startup company to where we are today. Great. Thanks very much. And Thank over you. to you, Ray. Okay, thank you. Let me just share my screen. Okay, can we see the first screen here? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. As I stated, uh, my name is Ray Mahan, uh, IBM uh, technology, uh, partner technology uh, specialist there, uh, work for IBM. Uh, covering both automation and security over the last number of years. Um, so basically what I'm going to go through here is uh, within the cybersecurity and why it, it's more prevalent now than before. And primarily 
a lot of technologies have moved so fast in their innovation, not in innovation, modernization in the last two to three years. And that was solely true to the pandemic. And basically, the pre, what, what infrastructures looked like two, three years ago was a large portion of the workforce was on-prem. So the perimeters around security were, could have been, were fairly tight. So with that, anybody within the organization, you would be wrapped around with firewalls, very different, uh, different, different types of security solutions and tools that would be already there in place. What has transpired now because of the pandemic, now that workforce has actually moved. And a lot of the workforce initially has moved out in, into homes, which is where I am from now. And what that has actually done for organizations is that that has imposed huge security risks because now what they have to contend with is that I'm working from home. I have access to potentially sensitive data on my laptop from my sitting room. Who, who is also there? Can I download that data? Can I access that data? So that's th this scenario now offers huge risk to organizations. And the huge, some of the big areas that, that we all have been hearing from would have been the, the ransomware attacks, the deficient type attacks that are constantly going on. And what organizations are trying to align to is a terminology or, or, or a philosophy called zero trust. And I'll talk a little bit further in on the zero trust side of things. And, and this is where we're going to evolve in, the, uh, evolve in this conversation itself. So what, what has actually transpired here is that because of the evolution of the landscape over the last couple of years, what that has actually made it is it actually made it a, a football ground for criminals. And it allows the, the, the criminals now to actually uh, penetrate even harder and faster into organizations themselves. Um, last year, ransomware had rose by a, an additional 21%. Uh, the biggest hit, hitters out there was actually phishing attacks. From, from organizations themselves, from, from the, the cyber criminals that are actually out there. Uh, OA, o, o, OT devices. So over, over the last number of years, huge, we've identified, IBM has identified huge reconnaissance into OT devices and the accessibility of them over the internet themselves. Also what we've actually, uh, through research and through marketing data, is some of the top targets that are actually been hit. And manufacturing has actually superseded financial and insurance. And that's an interesting one. You said, manufacturing doesn't really make much of a difference, but it actually does because what the attackers are actually doing is they're going after the supply chain. So rather than going directly after an organization, they're finding out what the supply chain is of that organization. And they're actually going after that to actually have a bigger impact on those themselves. So. A big thing that organizations are actually moving to and are actually looking at, and all the security leaders are focusing on uh, this concept of zero trust. So it's not a product. It's not a solution. It's, it's not a project that you do once and forget. So zero trust is basically an approach. It's, uh, it's a philosophy that you have to embrace. And basically the overall premise and the, the principles behind zero trust and there's three, three main principles and they're, they're not that complicated. And the first one is least privilege. So, so basically don't trust anything. So don't trust the users, don't trust your applications. Um, so you actually clamp down on everything. And then you have the next one, which is ver verify continuously. So anytime I, as an individual, employees, applications try to access data, constantly verify. And then the main thing is always assume a breach because no matter what, they're always, the attackers are always there on the sideline waiting for the little nugget that will actually get them into your organization and they will actually start their attack. An attack generally doesn't happen instantly. What you may hear is, okay, there's a, been a breach in a particular organization. But the attackers may have actually been there for weeks, months, if not even longer. And, and that's the big thing that, that organizations have to protect from. 
minimum uh, breaches in some cases, as far as the cost of the organization, 1.7 million. And that is a lot less uh, for, for organizations to have a mature uh, security trust approach. And, and, and this is it. It's technology. It's how people actually embrace and change how they actually are more disciplined in how they work within the organization and because we're actually working outside of the organization. And, and that's the big, some of the big key things that organizations have uh, in relation to what has happened over there. And like the benefits that organizations are finding when they do actually embrace uh, a zero trust type approach is faster adoption of the cloud. Now, where that more so comes into is that you have a better understanding of where your data resides, whether it's on-prem, whether it's on the cloud. You have a better understanding of the type of security uh, approaches that you need to be aware of and you need to ask for your cloud providers. Uh, provide uh, improved uh, business resilience and continuity. So again, uh, embrace the security out there and also embracing the types of backup type capabilities and allowing yourself as it's and it doesn't have to be a large organization small organization it's all about the data and it's all about the access to that data and how people and uh, applications access uh, access that data itself so what what we have discovered in, in talking to a lot of our clients that there are four major um, uh, challenges that organizations have actually encountered and we all know a majority. One is, and probably the, the, the largest, obviously, is the protecting of the data. And now data is, it's, it's all over. So it's either on-prem or it's in a, a cloud provider of some shape or form. And also what we have is we've, we've the risk of our workforce as well, having some of that data. So it's been able to understand where data resides and been able to understand how to protect that data. The remote workforce because of the pandemic that has actually moved the workforce out of the initial security perimeters of working in an office to now I'm actually working from home. How do I secure my workforce? How do I actually protect the workforce and the organization just in case the workforce is actually breached? Um, predict and prevent, understanding what tools and solutions are out there that you can A, purchase or that you can actually talk to vendors like IBM and there's other vendors out there that supply a lot of solutions around to predict, to prevent and the response side of things of, of threats of today and, and to understand those areas and where you can actually go from that. And then the overall goal for these challenges for organizations is to improve their security posture. So it's to build the, the case around what is valuable to an organization and how they can actually protect that organization itself from threat. So what we're going to talk about here is uh, the main driver uh, into the problem uh, of securing data, uh, critical data itself. And when we're talking about uh, protecting data across hybrid, you have to understand where your data is. So your data may be on servers, locally in a data center in your small office you have a, a, a couple of servers or you may have actually outsourced where you're actually using a, a cloud provider and it's to understand where that data resides also been, been organizations I, i've set up my own company and you you have to understand the data that you're going to be working with also you have to understand the cloud providers that you're also going to be working with and the big key thing that that you need to actually realizes, okay, if, if I'm with a cloud provider, what if something happens with that cloud provider? What's the backup strategy? Because if you have data that resides uh, or, or that is part of the EU, uh, we fall on the GDPR. Because of that, if your data provider fails over into a non-European entity, what is the strategy and, and what is the issue that, that potentially will be exposed to you? So it's understanding that the data privacy is prevalent out there. Organizations, if they don't trust that their data is actually private uh, and that you can you can supply true privacy, um, they won't actually deal with you. So it's been able to actually embrace that. Understanding, as you can see from the chart there, 
on the top right hand side side understanding that you you have to protect the data both at rest and in transit and in transit might be that i'm accessing the website and some personal information or some data is actually sent back to me via that website that's in transit all of that data needs to be encrypted also what needs to take place is that you need to actually only provide the necessary information that I, I, I need or I am authorized to actually receive. So it's also minimizing the amount of data that I actually receive. Been able to have the capability to audit and compliance. Um, with that, that, that is following the various uh, regulations that are out there and been able to have solutions or entities that will help you in those areas. GDPR, SOX, HIPAA, so any solution or any entity that, that you go to provide either servers or solutions to actually help you within your business. Sorry, a bit of a dry throat. Uh, <clears throat> you as a, as a startup or as a small entity still have to adhere to the regulations and the compliance that are out there. Data retention. You need to understand that what data you're actually using, what what retention policies might fall within that data itself. Uh, so you need to understand that if data needs to be backed up, where it's going to be backed up, what's the recovery process. Again, data, 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 data protection. Driving out, being able to identify your data, where it resides on-prem and off-prem. Um, the structure of that data, being able to classify that data and being able to actually wrap security around that data that only the minimum amount of data is served to a person when they request it and when they have actually been verified that they are who they actually say they are. So trust nothing and verify everything. And and, and this, this is where I'm still going. Uh, I, I just have touched on the verifying. We, we have to verify everything, plain and simple. Where, whether it's an application, sorry, whether it's an application, whether it's actually a user, we need to actually step back and we need to assume that everything that's going to connect to my data or it's going to access that data that I have to verify. Now, whether you're the holder of the data or you're going to be a consumer. So if you're going to consume, say, medical data, that you have correct access to that medical data, that it's secure on how you communicate to that data, how that data is actually brought back to you is also secure and encrypted. So it's wrapping around a full security envelope on the remote workforce and how that workforce actually accesses the data. And, and these are things that, that have to be prevalent in, in when you actually set up. Areas that you have here is business and uh, privileged users um, where organizations have to be able to clamp down on who has access you can't give the keys of the kingdom to one person you have to divide those duties up because no matter what uh, a lot of security breaches don't just happen from the peripheral coming in they also happen inside so you potentially have the attack of insider threat now whether that's malicious or not i could accidentally do something and give data or give my privileged accounts over to somebody un unknown to myself an organization has to protect around that. Uh, bringing your own devices in to organization, that's a huge area that an organization has to, and yourselves will have to adhere to, that you need to ensure that if you're working, say, with tablets, and there are solutions out there, uh, if you're primarily working with tablets or laptops, uh, where you can actually secure areas within that laptop that are encrypted. And if you're dealing with an organization, you're only dealing within that encrypted area. And there are a lot of mobile solutions that, that organizations, IBM providing the well as well, uh, Mass360, uh, where they actually encapsulate and, and if a device is stolen, there's no way of accessing that particular area where the applications and those authorizations uh, reside. So it's to understand the areas that you need to reach out to, understand the areas that you also need to ask providers when you're actually dealing with. Uh, as far as what are their policies for connecting. If you're an application development house and you use APIs, what is the best preferred method of connecting to a particular data set? 
um, who manages it, what, what is the encryption policies, who manages the keys for those encryption policies. So fast adapting, uh, or adapt faster. And basically un understanding the, the threat landscape itself. And the big thing is around predict, prevent, and respond. And as, as a small entity, what you're going to be looking at is, okay, as, as an entity, what can I do myself? And it's more the areas that you can protect yourself. And then it's the areas that, okay, well, I'm not a big organization, but is there entities out there? And there are a lot of uh, providers, business partners to both IBM and other vendors out there that supply these services. And, and they're the organizations that you'd be looking to reach out to. Because if you don't have uh, predict and prevent, you'll have poor visibility of your environment. Um, and basically you're blind to what's actually going on. And areas that, that we would start off is um, starting off on your laptop, you would have an antivirus. So antivirus is, is grand. It will detect uh, it will detect attacks that are known. But what an antivirus won't do is it won't detect abnormal or zero day threats. And there has been a number of them that have actually cropped up over the last number of years. And it's those new threats that are, are huge. And the, the evolution of the antivirus is EDR, which is endpoint detect and response. And those type of solutions are key because they also have antivirus, but what they actually do is, say I, I actually download uh, from a reputable site uh, a Word document that I'm working on, but I don't know that the Word document is actually uh, weaponized. And um, what an EDR solution will actually do is it will actually track the behavior and say, okay, Word shouldn't be opening up Internet Explorer and trying to actually uh, do cross script uh, uh, attacks. So it, it starts to identify those things earlier. The next thing is NDR, and that, that is network detection response. And that is protecting the network itself, both internal and external, and understanding the traffic that is actually going across the network, both um, directly in, in the organization, uh, traffic coming over the, the Wi-Fi as well, and internet traffic. Uh, all of that information, and you, you'll hear what's, what's known as a SIEM, which is a security information event management solution. And it is a central hub for gathering firewall information, for gathering application information, authentication information, DNS information. So all of this information that we produce when we log on to a server, when we try to access a particular application, whether we successfully or fail to actually access the di that data, events are generated. And the scene is the central location that a SOC uh, would manage. And what a SOC is, is a security operational center. And basically within there, within the scene, it has the ability to, to cross-reference events starting on one side of an organization to another side. So it'll actually do early detection of uh, potential attackers that might be actually trying to infiltrate or may already be in an, an organization and it'll actually start to map out uh, what you have part and parcel of that is UBA, which is user-based uh, analytics or behavioral analytics. And, and what that it, it basically does is it identifies behaviors that have changed. So I, as an individual, I normally uh, access application A and application A uses data in database B, uh, where tomorrow I'm working for some reason over in, say, Turkey or whatever, uh, but now I'm trying to access a different application, which has access to a completely different set of data. And those type of behaviors are anomalous type of behaviors. And that's what these types of solutions do. SOAR on the right-hand side. So basically SOAR is a security uh, uh, orchestration. And what SOAR will actually do is it'll integrate into automation capabilities. So SOAR will be your single pane of glass over all of those entities. 
So you'll have different scenes, different uh, NDRs and EDRs responding, uh, responding into a store solution. And then you'd have automation uh, tools like uh, Red Hat Ansible on the sideline that would integrate into different products. Just raise do. audio. Pardon? Ray, just when you went into sower there, we lost your audio. If you could just take it from there, please. Sorry, sorry about that. Thanks, Emil. Um, so in relation to SOAR, SOAR would be your single pane of glass. And SOAR is your single pane of glass that will actually take all the events and information, both from the scene, from the network side of things, and from the endpoint side of things. And your SOAR will actually integrate and orchestrate into an automation tool. One automation tool would be Red Hat Ansible, which Red Hat Ansible would have integration into other third party products, both on the network side and on the backup side and on the server side. So there's a lot of integration that you can actually get from that. And they're, they're areas that help you to prevent and detect and respond to potential problems uh, within an organization. So what organizations try to adhere to, and it's by actually taking up a zero trust uh, strategy in moving forward is, that they get a better understanding of their maturity. And, and basically what we have here will be areas of maturity that an organization has and how they can actually align that. And most organizations, IBM is no different. Uh, we, we offer uh, zero day uh, workshops. So there would be a discovery workshop where we would actually talk to an organization. We'd get information on how uh, they do uh, their day-to-day -day business what security they have in place now. And what we allow the organization to do is we map their maturity. And what we also do is we align some of their gaps with whether it's um, uh, goals. So we give them goals that they actually can strive for, that they can actually move for and, and move forward and improve on those strategies. And that's the overall goal of a zero trust type strategy is the point, the gaps uh, that are prevalent and that are directly uh, will improve the business itself because each organization is different. And, and this is what, what is, is zero trust uh, engagement will actually help organizations do. And it's pr primarily trying to identify those areas. Excuse me. Um, to map out how an organization can improve their security posture, areas that they need to be aware of and areas that they need to improve in. And in some cases, it's, it's not going to be technology. It might be, okay, we need to retrain our, our people in, in the way they think. So it's actually mapping out in, in a better format how an organization actually runs both technology and as individuals. So it, it, it may be a, mi a mixture of business process and individual process and technology all wrapped around. And the, the one thing we would say is uh, zero trust is not anything new. It's been around for over a decade. Uh, the overall premise, as I, as I stated earlier on, with zero trust is firstly, um, never trust, always verify limit uh, privileged access. So it's been able to manage access and always um, constantly verify who that person is, where that person is, or where the application is as well. And then always assume that there's going to be a breach. No two ways about it. The, the, the attackers are always there on the sideline waiting for some vulnerability. To actually appear and things for for small organizations that you can actually do on that <clears throat> is email management how you manage and how you uh, download data is practices that that you can take yourself of protecting when you're actually going out to say a cloud provider what offerings do they have uh, in relation to email what offerings do they have in relation to prevention and detection as well and encryption so there's a lot of areas that you can reach out to. Nobody's expecting you to be a security person, but what you should be able to do is to have at least some of the terminology that you need to check. Does other entities have 
And when you're dealing with different types of data, what does that organization recognize as some security standards that you may have to follow yourself? And it, it may be through a third party that you follow that because security isn't going to be your, your primary goal. You have your own business, whether it's a two to four to 50 people business, you have your own goals of that business where security you can't ignore, but you need to embrace it. And whether it's embracing that through a third party, that, that'll actually allow you to actually bridge those gaps when you actually communicate uh, with, with vendors that you're actually working on. Uh, IBM at a glance, uh, and this is just on our security, there's, we're about 200 odd, 250,000 people in IBM, but in security alone, we've got 850, uh, 8,500 people over uh, 130 uh, countries. Uh, areas that, that we would dabble in, uh, not dabble in, areas that we would actually uh, be key leaders in would be the threat management, uh, data security, identity and access management. And identity and access you may hear, so that, that is the management of accounts. So you need an account to actually log on. And then the access is the type of access that you have in the background as soon as you're actually authenticated. Been able to detect fraud within an organization, uh, security strategy, risk and compliance. And, and these are entities that are key for anybody that is going to be dealing with data. And, you would have had a previous session where you were talking about GDPR and security will be also wrapped around GDPR because you have to have an understanding of if you become a data processor, what, what is the requirements that, that I have as well uh, to actually manage and to go through the, that, uh, that management and the access of, of that data itself. So basically, we we probably have one of the largest, broadest set of security portfolios. Um, so we cover from the alignment side to uh, alignment on the strategy and understand the maturity models of various organizations. On the protect side, so we would have numerous uh, solutions in different disciplines that we would be able to manage and protect both the identity data application and endpoint and the cloud itself. Uh, going all the way over to the managed side, which would be the defense uh, with the threats, and that would be with the SOARS and the EDR. And these are areas that, that you would probably reach out into tour parties. Uh, and it's more, okay, well, how do you manage uh, identity and access management? How do you manage governance of data? Uh, what are your privileged uh, uh, policies? Uh, that you incorporate. What do I need to hear to uh, when I'm dealing with a different type of an organization? And in your case, uh, as, as new starters, you need to have an understanding of the potential area that you're going to be working in, obviously, the data, and then the implication of working with that data, both on-prem and at rest. And the, these would be some of the solutions that, that you would actually, uh, on the IBM side, reach out and, and try and embrace. Uh, one thing I did mention down here on the unified endpoint management side is the MAS360. A MAS360, what it actually allows you to do is on a mobile device, it allows you to actually uh, compartmentalize that mobile device that you have a secure area. If, if that's, that is going to be designated as corporate and you can actually, if that device gets lost automatically, when that device reconnects to, to the, the internet, automatically delete it um, so that if it's stolen, it's encrypted, it cannot be accessed. So it actually mitigates a lot of that risk. And then other solutions from Guardian, which would be one on the left-hand side, which is data security. So identifying and classifying data, restricting data down to the state of you, you only actually are going to access a portion of this data don't need all these 10 columns, you only need access to two of these columns. So it's to understand that, to understand the risk of that. Um, and I think that would be it. A huge brain dump on a lot of potential areas on security side itself. Okay, is there... That's super, Ray. Um, thank you very much. Really comprehensive, gives us lots, lots to think about. And I really liked your diagram there with the, the audit of where we're at now and where we need to get to. It's It gives us a good visual of how to get a handle of, of a cyber secure culture um, yeah. in a startup.
So um, I, I invite our attendees to put your questions into the Q&A. And uh, but right now I'm going to hand over to Arthur. Um, so Arthur, take it away. Thank you. Sure, sure. Can everyone see that? Yes, Arthur, we can, yeah. Okay, there we go. Okay, um, Ray has certainly covered a lot of the detail and then what, what a lot of the standards and what you guys are going to actually need to be aware of. Um, what I'm going to go through is very much stat sports experience and how we dealt with and some of the security issues. So I'll explain what those issues were and then what we put in place and uh, to actually deal with them. So it's very much, let's say, an application of a lot of the topic staff Ray has actually covered. It's important to understand, I suppose, a little bit about Statsports um, and the type of data that we're collecting. As a company, uh, Statsports provide uh, technology to professional sports clubs and professional sports athletes. Uh, we uh, deal with a lot of recognizable brands across the world, and we just have a collection up here of the type of brands that we're dealing with. We typically deal in football, soccer, uh, Gaelic football, rugby, cricket, American football, and some basketball as well. So we're an international organization. Um, this is just basically the type of technology that we provide. We provide a hardware device, which is on the top here, which is worn by the players. And we capture data on the players, on the performance of the players. And then we provide software tools that provides the coaching staff managers with insights on the performance of the players. Um, that's, and we've been developed, we've been selling in this business for over 10 years. So we've, this is probably our third generation product. Uh, so it's been providing the, the insights that to maximize the performance of, of players. It's worth knowing actually. So this is very much our elite side. Um, and our technology would be worn by really the well-known players like the World Cup's on at the moment. So we would have players, uh, the likes of Messi, Ronaldo, Harry Kane, that, uh, and lots of other players that are wearing this technology on a daily basis. So you can understand that the data that we're capturing, not only is it sensitive to the clubs, it's also uh, if it becomes... Um, lost or gets out into, let's say, the general public, uh, there's a lot of concern about that. So you can see why security and data security is a very important and a key aspect for, for ourselves. This is very much our elite business. So this is with the top end clubs. We also have um, what we term a consumer version of this so that you can buy a similar wearable piece of technology uh, as a consumer and we again will measure the performance of the consumer while they're doing their activities um, it's available off the website and uh, we provide a lot of uh, in our user interface for for this particular product on a mobile phone so we do so that's our sort of consumer business it's uh, and quite separate from our elite business if I look at the sort of challenges that we have, and particularly around the security point of view, so we have here on the left hand side, the Apex pod. So this is the wearable. And we then wirelessly transmit data to a lot of these devices. So to laptops, tablets, phones, and to Apple watches. So we have a concern with data, let's say going over the air on, on these wireless networks. This data is also, streamed up to the cloud. So we have challenges up on the cloud in terms of keeping that data secure. So um, I just wanted to set this as a picture. So, because this is what I'm going to be talking about is the concerns we have and the sort of the, the mitigation and how we developed 
uh, a lot of our soft software to be able to mitigate the challenges that will come from the security aspect. Um, if we look at here, um, and we're just putting, putting up here the key things that we have to deal with. If, if, if we look at Phil Foden here, Phil Foden's holding uh, the Apex device that he would have worn, let's say, during, during the session in his left hand. And he's looking at the data from it in his mobile device. What we do is we transmit data from the device to the phone over Bluetooth. That data is also pushed up to the cloud so that uh, Phil Foden can come along and look at his data at some point in the future. So the challenges we had were we needed to encrypt the data on, on the device because uh, Phil Foden's device could be stolen, for example. And if somebody uh, was able to tap into that data, then you can imagine that would go on, on, onto social media and would cause an absolute horror. Um, challenges on there. So we needed to encrypt on a, a device. So we needed to actually, we didn't develop a, an encryption algorithm, but we needed an encryption algorithm that um, could run on, let's say, a low powered device. Because uh, we didn't have, um, we didn't have the horsepower on the device to actually do the full 64 bit uh, encryption. Um, we also needed to encrypt on the mobile device itself. Um, and because we were sending this data up to the cloud, we needed to encrypt it up in the cloud. Okay, so in three different areas. Because we were doing all this wirelessly, we needed to encrypt the data during transit as well. So that, that, was, that was a challenge that we had. Um, so encryption, was one of the main mitigating um, components that we put into that. We also then had an authentication service because you can, you access the data through uh, a mobile phone. So the key things that we uh, needed to put in here was obviously to identify the person. Um, we only provided access to particular pieces of data that was relevant to them. And the key thing in here is that you refresh the identity. So you don't just identify once and you hold that identity on the phone indefinitely. So we would tend to refresh or require a re-authentication every couple of hours uh, so that you're continuously, so that the mobile phone can't be stolen and then for people to get in, into that data. We use... Um, now, there, is, there are multiple suppliers of authentication service, but we've used Auth0 for our authentication services. And there, I assume IBM provide uh, authentication services as well. I think the, there'll be a lot of suppliers that will manage that for, or can manage that for you. Um, then when we're on the cloud, um, and really Ray has covered this in a lot more detail, but really what I wanted to get across here were some of the key elements. Offer authentication Hello? services. Hi, Arthur, we just lost you there for a second, but continue, I, I think we, we didn't miss anything. You were talking about authentication services. Yeah, yeah. Fires so, off. Yeah, yeah, the, um, the one that we've used is Auth0, so. Can you repeat that, Arthur? Auth0, it's name. Auth0, okay, thank you. The, we also need it then on the cloud side. And as I said, I won't go into detail because I think Ray has covered this in a lot of detail, but it certainly would be my recommendation for, for you guys that you do use the hosted services because they'll have the tools and facilities that will help you on this journey of, of securing your data. But these are some of the services that we availed of. So it's, it's to do obviously with the traffic management coming in and this, certainly more the case on our consumer product. We needed um, a web application firewall, generally known as a WAF, to do with API management. Then also the intrusion detection service. And I think Ray uh, uh, went through a lot of this in, in detail. And in fact, I was also learning today from Ray's presentation that these services have moved on in the last couple of years, uh, because I'm quite conscious we would have done this probably three, four years ago. 
which is always good. Uh, and again, a key thing, uh, you use database technology that uh, has encryption when it's at rest. Um, that's certainly worthwhile. So you don't have to worry about if, if your database is broken into, if you have a good encryption on there. Okay, um, what I've covered previously was very much around the product development side and the sort of things that we have to put into our products to secure our data for our clients. Um, one of the things that we also identified that we needed to put into place as a company was um, ISO 27001. Now, there's a no, there were a number of different drivers of this. Some of it was because we're dealing with um, clients, um, pretty, pretty well-known clients internationally, there would have been an expectation from them that we had ISO 27001 uh, as a company. And I suppose one of the ways that I would describe ISO 27001 company is that it's an international standard, but it's obviously that it's, uh, it, it really validates you as a company that you manage data uh, professionally with inside your organization and that they, uh, our, our clients can have trust in you in terms of being a supplier of services to them. So that's, that's probably the main advantage of it. Uh, a lot of times as well, we, um, could only tender for um, projects if we actually had ISO 27001. Um, that's it from, let's say, the commercial side. But I, I would also say, having gone through the process internally, I would also say that it is, even, even for smaller companies, and I understand the challenges that you have to go through, I certainly think you should be looking at going in that direction. While you might not pay to actually uh, get ISO 27001 and all the auditing that goes with that, I would certainly recommend that you start putting in place and looking at the standard and start putting in those processes internally within your organization. Because as your organization grows, you will have to put these um, standards in place. So you may as well start sooner rather than later. And what it, the way I often describe it, it's actually best practice when, and, and having gone through the process, it's a lot of work, and don't, don't get me wrong, but you having gone through it, you feel a lot more confident in your organization. And one of the examples is around your data recovery, that, uh, for example, you'll have thought about and you'll have put um, an SOP in place on data recovery so that if something fails within be it a hard drive, whatever it is that fails within inside your organization, that you can recover that. Um, because if you don't have a good data recovery uh, in place and it goes down, you can lose your business quite easily uh, if you don't have that in place. So it's definitely something you should be considering. Um, and I would certainly recommend that you start the process and putting it in and also doing it to a standard. Uh, a, the standard is already defined and it defines the type of things you should be looking at. And, and, and secondly, at some point in the future, you might want to take on and, uh, and actually become ISO 27001 compliant. What I would mostly say, it's very much, it's definitely a company-wide system and it's very much a culture and that culture has to be driven from the top. You need to drive this down within, within inside your organization and agree that you're actually going to follow these processes. Once you have the SOPs in place, it, it is not very onerous at all, actually. And you know that you'll be following really good processes. And uh, it covers everything within the company. The one thing it doesn't really cover is uh, if, if you do development work, it doesn't really cover that in, in any great detail. And I'll come on to that on the next slide. 
but uh, in terms of managing your company, it's definitely something that I would recommend that you at least consider. Uh, I have on the bottom here, so these are the different standards, uh, additional standards that we support. And now this isn't all very much on the sporting side, but I would be a huge advocate that if there are standards out there, that um, you should aim to follow them. So you should, um, because you know, lots of other people have thought about the challenges that you guys will have, uh, and there'll be solutions within them, within, within inside those standards. Last pay, uh, this is very much something that's just ongoing. And uh, we are doing a medical device product. Basically, that's going to take, um, we measure a lot of this in our normal sporting business, but what we wanted to do was actually dip our toe into the medical device area. And so uh, we've identified this project that is going to measure oxygen saturation, uh, heart rate and activity all on uh, from the same device. And we are designing that to a medical device standard 13485. Um, we we needed or we would not have done this if we did not have R and D grants to do it. Uh, it's not it's 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 not central to our business, but it's one of those things that uh, with the grant funds it allowed us to invest in it and potentially to open up a new market for us. Uh, so we ended up getting. Uh, uh, an R&D grant fund for a consortium um, because we're partnering with um, with companies that are already existing within within the medical uh, marketplace. Um, we also identified um, state funding. Now it happened to come from Invest and I for um, basically for companies that were doing medical device development and wanted to take on a consultant that would take them through that. Um, I would certainly recommend the consultant if, if, if you don't have any knowledge of it. Um, and we kind of look at this development internally so that look, we obviously want to, to sell this into the, um, into the medical market. But if that doesn't happen, what we actually get on the output of this is we get um, a, an excellent quality management system. So it's the best in practice of how to design product. So we'll end up um, identifying all the things that you would need to do in terms of developing the product. You follow sets, procedures and processes that maximize the time and effort and the designs that you put in place. As I said, I've, I've, I've worked for many years in, in startups and while you would be challenged, all, all this time to market was the biggest challenge and often you would take shortcuts to do that. While you might get to the initial time to market, a lot of the time that came back and you would have to re readdress some of the things that you took the shortcuts on. I think putting in a good quality management system helps minimize that, uh, that you try and identify as much of this upfront before, before it gets designed into your product. And I think, yes, it's a lot of work to set up, but I think once set up, you, I, you again can feel confident that your uh, design process is robust and will deliver a quality product for you. Um, Arthur, I'm going to join you there and that's a great way to finish off this um, sure. this webinar series because throughout the webinar series we have um, we have a looked at topics such as interoperability, GDPR, cybersecurity and and all of these topics we reiterate each time cannot be retrofitted well can at a very high cost both financially and to the growth um, path of the of the company. But um, retrofitting is never a good idea. So you have just really wrapped that up in a little nugget for us there that you've been there, done it, and it's it's the worst way to develop a product. Yep. 
And also we have a question in the chat, which this question comes up um, each time we, um, we investigate one of these topics around funding. So obviously um, funding is never uh, something that um, startups have in, in spades and therefore there one so there is a question in the chat for um for Ray uh, but I'll invite both of you to come in here um and uh, in terms of startups where is where funding is often limited what kind of financial investment is required to get a uh, cyber security up and running and, and develop a, a cyber culture yeah <laughs> that 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 question is nearly how long is a piece of string because yeah, exactly. it, it it depends on the area E easy disciplines that, that we can all come up with is cheap and cheerful password management type solutions. Uh, been able to, because a big problem that people have is using the same password. Uh, I, I have my, my phone the last number of years, a uh, product called uh, LastPass, uh, which is 70, 80 euros a year, but actually allows me to manage all my passwords uh, and it allows that type of scenario. Then the, the next thing is, depending on the organization, if I'm an organization that's building an application, okay, well, what are the other security uh, areas I need to invest in? Encryption, uh, API usage, uh, data usage, as far as backup and recovery. Um, it, it, it all depends. Uh, it really does. I, I can't sort of say £4.50 will do everything. It won't. It depends on your requirement. And it... And again, and even what Arthur, Arthur was saying there as well, is it's investing in what's required for your business, understanding what some of the cloud uh, service providers offer, because you, you don't know all the security. You may know, okay, I need to protect this area, but it's by actually getting in contact with them. Uh, we would have business partners that would do security consultancy. So it's talking to the people that work in that area and they would actually map out, okay, best suit your needs. These are the areas that you need to, to harness on the security side. And then it's going to be the research into those areas. So I, I, I can't sort of say yeah. exact figures. Yeah. What I you're would... really saying is eat the elephant in bites, start where you can. Exactly. And, uh, and totally. I'm delighted to see our colleagues in Enterprise Ireland on this call because Enterprise Ireland and your local enterprise office do have funding around digitization and funding consultancy uh, to develop your digital path. Um, please come to Deconnect and we will help you to, to, uh, to, to work on your pitch for your local enterprise office um, or Enterprise Ireland. Um, Arthur, sorry, over to you. You were going to give us some of your, your insights there. Yeah, yeah, no, I would agree with Ray. As I said, I had the same term, how long is a piece of string? Um, what the way I would approach it, and you need to look at your own business, what's the key vulnerability that you have or potentially have? And that's probably where you, you should start. Correct. And, and take it as bite size. So take, take the key one and uh, focus on that to begin with, because you can spend a fortune. And, um, I have no doubt uh, to cover everything, but ultimately it comes down. What's the most important thing for your business? That's super. And, and as I say, I'm just going to reiterate there that um, there is funding available because it's, a, it's, it's an imperative to engage a consultant, somebody who really knows how to develop a digital path for you and with you. And then yeah. to develop, to eat the elephant in bites, to develop a growth, a, a, a path to roll out your digitization in, in every area um, in, an, in a way that's a, a sustainably fundable for you. And the, so come to Deconnect and we'll help you with your pitch for your local enterprise office or Enterprise Ireland. Um, now, I'm just going to um, finish off by thanking our contributors very much and uh, by letting you know about the uh, program that we have available in the new year to help you with your um, business development. And I'm going to share now um, some brief information regarding the um, this program. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here. Uh, so where are we now, Canva? Here we go. And um, I'm going to present. So can everybody see this in present mode? Yeah. 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 Um, so uh, in the new year, we are, well, actually, sorry, in December now, we're launching um, the recruitment process and we'll start to recruit um, after Christmas for our um, eHealth Embark Digital Health Accelerator program. So this is for startups and SMEs who are at that early sta uh, stage um, and are ready to grow to perhaps you've developed a minimum viable product or um, a, a beta um, prototype. 
um, and you now need to scale it. Uh, and you need to, uh, you need to implement um, GDPR, cybersecurity, and so on along the way. Um, our partner in this particular um, uh, program is AWS, and there there is a prize to be won of one hundred thousand K. Sorry, I forgot my K there of um, AWS credits to help you to scale your business in AWS infrastructure. Um, it consists of six weekly seminars uh, with business mentoring and tech mentoring in between each of the seminars. Um, so the business mentoring will help you with identifying your clinical need and validating your solution, um, sizing the market and developing your minimal, vi minimum viable product, building your product roadmap um, and your go to market strategy and then pitching your innovation. The tech mentoring will audit your current tech infrastructure to identify your growth needs, develop a scale up plan, get you to proof of concept and then build a tech roadmap for the future. And each one of the participants um, gets 2000 uh, AWS credits, $2,000. Uh, so the launch date is the 1st of December. And the, um, as I said, we will begin to recruit. Um, we have 10 places on this program. Um, so we'll begin to recruit uh, just after Christmas. Um, so if you'd like more information, please contact on anything that we've discussed here today, please contact support at deconnect.ie. And uh, I just want to finish off by thanking our attendees and for even staying on that extra few minutes um, after one o'clock and especially to our two, two contributors. And I just want to mention that uh, both IBM and Statsports are members of our Connected Health and Wellbeing cluster, which I mentioned at the beginning, and the cluster meets once a month to uh, share information such as you have heard here today. Um, so it's a very um, affordable and uh, efficient way to get the information that you need and the knowledge that you need to grow your business. So please contact us uh, um, also if you would like to join the Connected Health and Wellbeing Cluster. So that's all from me. Um, Arthur, Ray, is there anything else you would like to add or are you happy to say nano nano and happy Christmas to our attendees? <laughs> Yes. OK, great. <laughs> perfect. OK, thanks very much to everybody and have a great Christmas. And uh, I hope it's restful and peaceful for you. Thank you very much. Happy Bye -bye. Christmas. Take care. Happy Christmas.